This episode of The Trap Set is brought to you by CNC Drums, handmade drums from Gladstone, Missouri. Check them out online at cncustomdrums.com. This is Joe Wong. Welcome to the very first episode of The Trap Set, where each week we examine the lives of drummers. I want to play something for you. You're hearing the sound of an audience on October 13th, 1995, at The Rave, an unavoidable rock club in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. This was an important night for 15-year-old me because it was the first time I saw Fugazi live. I'd heard of them, but I didn't own any of their albums, and I wasn't too familiar with their music. The room was hot and humid from a thousand sweaty bodies mixed with the fog of cigarette smoke. The band came on stage and insisted that the house lights be turned on. They didn't believe in dramatic stage lighting. Then, without ceremony, they tore into a relentlessly powerful set that filled the room with pure energy and changed my life. In the weeks following the show, I got more and more obsessed with Fugazi. They quickly became my favorite band. And the more I learned about them, the more I respected them. They were the definition of an independent band. They ran their own label, booked their own tours, and they made sure all their shows were accessible. Ticket prices were always five bucks, and the shows were always all ages. They were the gold standard to which every band I played in and countless others around the world aspired. Arguably, they were the most important rock band of their time. But what made Fugazi truly great wasn't their business practices or their cultural significance. It was their music. And the band was powered by the dynamic, hypnotic, and explosive drumming of my guest today, Brendan Canty. Fugazi went on indefinite hiatus in 2003, but Brendan pressed on. He played drums for artists like Bob Mould and Garland of Hours. He scored films like The Weather Underground and TV series like National Geographic's Hard Time. He produced records for Ted Leo, Mary Timoney, and The Thermals. And along with his wife, Brendan is raising four kids at their home in Washington, D.C. My interview with Brendan Canty, coming up. How did you get into music in the first place? Like, what was the first music that you were listening to that really excited you, or the first band that really excited you? Like when you were a kid, can you remember? Oh, some... like as a as a kid, kid. Yeah, yeah. Before before I got into punk rock. Yeah. Um, then be like, like working backwards. I would say before punk rock, I was super into Funkadelic, like Parliament and Funkadelic, because I went to DC public schools, and that's what was big in the schools. So at dances, we would play, we would dance to Parliament, you know. Um, and then before that, disco, straight up disco, you know, um, you know, Lips Incorporated, and you know, you know, um, bat, you know, radio music, you know, mm-hmm. basically K Tel collections of things. I mean, we always had. A, we always had records and music and, a, you know, a turntable at the house. And I always, you know, would buy records. But the records were always disco records and K-Tel collections of of 70s hits, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, I listen to music all the time. But I do, I will say, like, if you want me to get more in-depth about things, I would say probably, it, you know, a lot of my, like, profound, like, interest in music and the idea of becoming a musician came from living in a house with s- seven kids and i'm number six out of seven okay all my older brothers and sisters like my oldest brother kevin who had his birthday yesterday who's a novelist is kevin canty he lives up in missoula montana he's on double day but he was a guitarist and a and you know growing up he he, he was an amazing guitarist he'd seen hendrix you know, six or seven times. He'd seen the MC5. He'd seen all these people. And he had all these records lying around. And same with my brother Dennis and my sister Mary. They were all within three years of each other. And they were all, you know, grew up in Berkeley, but then moved to New York and then moved to D.C. So all through this, the 60s, you know. Um, and so they all had a million stories. You know, I saw Jim Morrison piss on the audience and at Meriwether Post. Or I saw, um, you know, or just, you know, mostly, I got to say, the Hendrix stories really were always, 
you know, amazing. And we had a jacket around the house that Hendrix supposedly wore um, that he had bought off a vendor outside the club. And, you know, we always had these. I mean, there was it was a super duper hippie growing uh, reality. My parents weren't hippies. My dad was a jazz piano player and but he was a, he was the editor of architecture magazine for like 20 years and um and, but he came from music he initially wanted to be a pianist so I was, we we're sort of all destined to live out the un, unlived lives of our parents i think in a lot of ways we're all sort of that's a great motivator for a lot of kids is that, so do you have an unlived life that your kids are going to live out um, I you know I don't know I guess so. I think what would it I be? think what would what my else unlived would you... lives would be if I they they're going to be f- uh, physicists or or writers. That's more. You seem like somebody that's pretty much lived out everything that you wanted to do. I'm ready to die. You know I'm only 47, <laughs> but I'm ready to go. I've got my Nikes on. Um. All right. Well. Okay. So there were there were there. <laughs> <laughs> there were there were seven of you kids in your family. Uh-huh, yeah. So, um, Canty, that's Irish. Is mm-hmm. are your folks Catholic? Or like, that, is it like an Irish Catholic kind of you thing? You are so astute. <laughs> it's really remarkable. <laughs> yeah. Like Irish my mom's Catholic. side of the family is Irish Catholic, and there were eleven of them in her family. So. Yeah. 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 My well, my mom was pregnant thirteen times, and she miscarried a lot, and two sets of twins. Uh, in there and all the all you know she was sad. she had a hard time you know it's funny you know you, I was reading this Beatles book recently and it's like so many kids back then died in t- childbirth like um, out or of, shortly thereafter too right well within right not childbirth right within the first two years there's like these endless stories of these poor ass ca- you know Catholic and Protestant Irish in Manchester who were I mean, or in Liverpool and they're um, you know, dying of teething problems is wh- how it's listed, or diarrhea, or it's horrible. So, anyways, I wonder if people just had to be more resilient back then and just keep moving. They need to wash up a bit better. I think that's the, that's the <laughs> <laughs> honestly. But it was like you'd have ten kids and just expect a few of them to die, and that's that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, John Lennon's great grandfather was breeding until he was sixty-seven. Wow, isn't that amazing? You gonna have more kids? No, oh, no, no. I, I totally, <laughs> I fixed that problem. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, what was it about um, your home growing up that cultivated an environment for such artistic kids? Yeah, it was really an, an environment of like benign neglect. I think. I mean, really, like there was with seven kids. Um, they, my kid, my parents were very loving, but they were also really like. You know, hard drinking, bridge playing, you know, they loved music and they just wanted to create like a stage for their family to happen. And they didn't want to be the stage manager necessarily. You know what I mean? They didn't want to have a stage manager. They was basically like, here's a big house. Here's a bunch of kids. And, you know, that's about it. I mean, I really didn't leave my block or my neighborhood until I got in Fugazi and got a passport and went overseas. I mean, wow. we were... Um, and you live in the same neighborhood now? I live about... A, yeah. It's the same zip code. I live about a mile from my old house. Do you um, do you stand by the benign m- neglect strategy for your own kids? Sure. Relaxed and casual parenting. Yeah. I've been trying to invent the five-mile baby monitor for a long time. <laughs> I think you could do an app for that. <laughs> <laughs> And you didn't feel like a lack of attention or anything when you were a kid? Though there were very evident times, you know, there were times when it was, you know, painfully obvious that I needed more attention. But uh, it was mostly a little later in life. Uh-huh. Not when I was a kid, necessarily. but when Like, I was, what's an example a, of that? You know, failing out of school was a big one. Tenth grade was, you know. You, they, had to f- you failed out? Yeah. Oh, completely. I had more absences than there were days in the year. There was I. I had my what mom were you doing out, with all that time? Dicking around. Like what kind of stuff? Uh, Drugs. Yeah, playing. No. Uh, yeah, it's funny. No, I not 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 at that point. No, I was like once I got you know into the music scene in DC, which was straight edge. You know, right? I really didn't t- drink or take drugs at all till I was like twenty nine years old. Um, what made you crack at age twenty nine? Kids having kids. 
<laughs> I started drinking. I'm not drinking. You started smoking I don't drink crack. The I don't drink anymore, but I was born. drinking for a while just because, you know, you're sitting around the house and they're driving you crazy. You you're know. done drinking. You don't drink at all anymore, or um, you know, for right now. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's been a while. But I feel like we were drinking scotch together a while back, or whiskey. Like, yeah. Couple- That's it. Yeah. When All was right. That? I know. I don't know why I'm getting on a microphone and saying it because I next time you see me, I'll probably be drinking scotch. But yeah, that was so. Uh, when was that? April? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. So you, I mean, is there something in particular that happened or you're just trying to live Recently? a healthier lifestyle that made you stop drinking? I have a lot of work to do. That's really it. This spring, I'm really, I have to finish two films and I have to. I have a big soundtrack job and I just really can't, you know, I just have to be working all the time. And it's like when you start drinking at night, you know, you end up spending a lot of time thinking about going out and hanging out with your friends and it's really great and it's really fun, but you're not, you really don't get half the work done you should be. Right. So I hate to lay it on you, but. (laughs) I thought I was feeding the muse the whole time. (laughs) I know, right? (laughs) So did I. (laughs) Okay. So, so you grew up in this hippie environment. And your parents were, um, my parents were a little more like goateed, kind of like fifties people. Yeah, I mean, well, if your like, dad was like, a jazz piano player, yeah, but he's he was old. obviously really creative, but he probably didn't go for like the sloppy sixties lifestyle type thing. Right? No, not at all. He was more like I mean, he liked to smoke and read. He was an intellectual. But he, was he was an intellectual. Also, yeah, yeah. But he and he loved his records. He'd have his, he'd bring break out his snot rag and try wipe the dust off his like Ellington records and tell you about how he saw Ellington with Ella Fitzgerald singing for him at the 1939 World's Fair. And you know, he always had a story about whatever. Were piece, you interested in music. that at the time? Yeah, like, yeah. I absorbed a lot of that. The his love of jazz his love of uh you know stravinsky and you know i mean he really there was a uh he had a good working knowledge of 20th century music from on both jazz and and classical but you know then i was like try to reciprocate and like oh dad you really need to listen to um bad you know, brains <laughs> no i never tried bad brains but it was like um public enemy i right. remember i was like uh this is really you know at the time it felt like things were moving in a different direction with sampling and all mm-hmm. this other stuff, and I thought he should listen to it. Did it's, he like Fugazi? You know, he only ever saw us once. He, uh, I mean, he was proud of me because he, I mean, he said so. He's he's very affectionate, but he only he had polio, so he didn't get around very well. He he walked with crutches his whole life, and um, and he only came out to see us once when we were up in Seattle. And he, we were playing in this big theater. It's like 1,200 people. And there's the place is going nuts. I mean, there's people. Guy is like tackling people off the stage. And it was like, I think it was in 91 or something. It was really like sort of the pinnacle of the craziness. And um, and my dad, I'm like playing, you know, playing drums. And I look over to my left. I see my dad coming through the stage door because he couldn't come through the crowd, obviously. But they let him on the stage, and he saw me, and he walked across the st- like, on stage, <laughs> and then stood right next to me, right to the left of me, and, like, was, like, standing there with his crutches. He had those, like, arm brace crutches, and he's looking around, and he's, he kind of looked like a silverback ape. He was all bent over and, like, kind of crazy and crotchety looking. He's looking over the crowd, and he's makes it through about a song, song and a half, and then he gives me a big knock on my arm, and he goes, all right, me and your mom are going home. <laughs> Great job. <laughs> and then he just lumbered home. I mean, that's, that's all you that's can ask it. for as a and kid. A song right? and a half, he yeah. made it through it. My mom saw me a bunch. He she, got it, she would right? go to, But he got it. Yeah, like, right, exactly. I, I get it. <laughs> yeah, right. I get it. Kids going nuts. Swinging from the rafters, I got it. I'm going home, you know. All right, so you were you were you kind of grew up listening to your dad's stuff and disco and maybe go go and all that stuff too, right? Yeah, go go. I mean, go go was a little, you know, later. Yeah, yeah, a little later, but yeah. So then, like, what was your first exposure to punk? Bad, like bad. Seeing the bad brains. My sister was a couple years older than me, and she would take me to like. Rocky Horror and stuff like that. Um, but she actually would take me to gigs. My parents were okay with me going with her to gigs. And so very early on, like, you know, 19, I think really early 1980s, so I was like 13, 14, 
is when I went to uh, I saw the Bad Brains for the first time. What was that like? I mean, did you have any idea what it what it was or? No, you... Bad Brains were like in, in like obviously like a million times better than everybody else on the planet. Like immediately, like, like, like when you walked in, did you know, have any idea what you were to expect? No, no, no. So no, it just I didn't. Blew yeah, you yeah. away. So it totally blew me away. Yeah, because they weren't playing. Weren't, there weren't actually that many people there, as I remember it, and they were like, you know, they were amazing. And you totally did like, you know, the whole at the movies backflip thing, and you know. <laughs> So it's really hard because, you know, you see that and then your whole DNA changes. You know, you're just like, oh, my God, this is the best thing ever. And then also- Were you a then, drummer at the time? No, I wasn't. I was not a drummer at the time. Did you play guitar first? or I played, anything? I sang in a band called Youth Courtesy Patrol, YCP, first. And my brother, Kevin, said to me, he goes, you know, you should play drums because if you play drums, you'll always be in a band. And if you're in a band, you'll always have a girlfriend. And did that work out? It, yeah, more or less. <laughs> <laughs> In, yeah. How did you work. meet Guy? I met him on the bus. I think Brian Baker. I was hanging out with Brian Baker. It was like one of my early friends. I don't remember how I met him, Brian Baker. But he was, uh, you know. Like on the bus to school? On the, I met him on the bus on the way home from school, really. Did you guys go to the same school? No, same he went school. to GDS, which is a school. Uh, it's a private school. Right. I went to the public school. Yeah, but, there were, but we were all kind of all just hanging around at the same time. And then Guy, I met Guy, and then I went over to Guy's house for the first time, and we recorded a 90-minute tape of, of music. For the first time, I went to his house. Do you I still can, have it? He does. Yeah, yeah, he has the tape. It's horrible, <laughs> but it's like, you know, I'm playing I'm actually playing drums on a on a globe that has like a metal bass and then the globe kind of the globe is uh was like the snare and the metal bass was the cymbal. So it's like don't you know, and he's playing like an un he didn't have an amplifier. He only had a Fender Mustang that he had he had gotten the money because he found a piece of wood in his cherry pie at, at uh, McDonald's. So he threatened to sue him and they gave him 300 bucks. So he got a Fender Mustang. And then we, so we, we just recorded. It was immediately that we were like, oh, let's just write songs. And we would just write, you know, immediately came up with um, 90 minutes worth of music and filled up the tape and called it the Black Light Panthers. And we continued to record as the Black Light Panthers as a joke band all the way through even Fugazi. We would play live as Black Light Panthers. So tell me about how that kind of came about. It seems like you guys were all friends from the punk scene in D.C. Um, and then how did you meet Joe? Through Ian. Okay. I mean, he was around. I, I sort of knew him. He initially, I knew him as like the beef eater roadie. And then I knew him, I knew, you know, I initially knew him as like a rocker. You know, like he would come in and buy heavy metal records at the, book, at the record store I, I worked at. And then he was like, you know, kind of straightening out and being a beef eater roadie. And then he then he was just hanging out with uh, Ian and being, uh, you know, living at his house and when he wasn't on tour with beef eater. We were all in the same group, the same, you know, universe together. Like, we spent a lot of time with each other, all of us. And we, would bowl, we were all straight-edge kids, so we would basically go bowling on Monday nights or go to the pool hall on, you know, and we'd stay up all night and we'd do, you know, it was really fun. It was a really big community of people that spent a lot of time together celebrating each other's birthdays and being geeky and watching, making fun of TV shows and whatever, you know, it's just being kids, being a community. Well, I mean, did did you, did it feel like there was instant chemistry the first time you went and played with those guys? Did it feel different? Yeah, I mean, it felt different in that, you know, it was a little bit more kind of rock, mm-hmm. honestly, than anything I'd done before. I mean, but I wasn't I wasn't necessarily afraid of that. You started the band, and then at what point did it kind of really take off and you were able to quit your job and just focus only on being a musician? You know, I, th- I think it took a few years. I think it took till 1990-ish. You know, I, I, I mean, I remember distinctly, I guess it wasn't too late into it, but we, you know, we'd gone up to, <laughs> this sounds so pathetic at this point, but I remember going up to somewhere in the Midwest and we were playing a show and I remember getting paid 250 bucks and I was thinking, well, if, if we can, if I can just do that every night, then I can quit the job at the bookstore. I'll be. <laughs> Like not just not me personally, but the whole band got two hundred and fifty bucks. 
<laughs> and I was super psyched to uh, <laughs> to have uh, even a glimmer of hope of having, um, you know, a future that didn't involve retail. But <laughs> did you have a plan in mind for like something you would do as a career if you didn't become like a, a successful, famous musician? Nope. I no had no backup plan whatsoever. I was a horrible student. Um, I liked to read. <laughs> so I did liked you to play music? <laughs> did you think that the band was going to take off the way that it did? Was that I was a good I was a good duck pin bowler. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, nope. No, I don't think anybody did. Honestly, and I never, quite honestly, never really felt. Like we were, you know, hugely successful, you know, during, even during when I was in Fugazi and we were getting lots and lots of people coming out and it was, there's still like a lot of different anxieties. I'm just, you know, probably because I'm an anxious person, but also probably because, you know, you kind of, and I might've mentioned this earlier, but you kind of, you kind of fool yourself into thinking that, um, you know that it's not gonna that that you that you have to keep working that you're halfway up the hill all the time, and that's like to me a crucial aspect of being me, <laughs> being an artist, and you know it's I don't know why, but I hear this from a lot of different artists and a lot of different musicians is that uh, you know they never really you don't really ever feel like you arrived anywhere ever you just keep plugging away at the whole business um were you enjoying yourself when you were in that band and and do you enjoy the actual work of making music now like does it give you the same high that it might have when you were a kid or does it just feel like more like a plotting methodical work no, it's I still really enjoy it. I mean, I really honestly, I that I like the process of working with people. I like the process of uh, writing with people. I like the challenge of writing songs. Um I you know, I I sometimes get stymied because, you know, there's there's a whole bunch of uh you know, it's really easy to say, "Wow, I fucking suck." You know, I just like I'm trying to write something and I can't and blah, blah, blah. Or I'm trying to have an idea and I can't, or I have an idea and it's terrible. There's so many ways to tell you, tell yourself that you suck. Yeah. That's I'm pretty good <laughs> at so, that. <laughs> yeah. Right. So yeah. So you go. So basically I think that there's a big part, big part of me that really likes going and working with people. And then you, you, you know, in collaborating, that's why, you know, collaborating with Rich Morell and death fix or collaborating with Gee or, collaborating with the band as a whole in Fugazi um, was so great because, um, you know, you bring your shit in and you throw it in front of somebody and then they bring their stuff in and you basically like, number one, not everything's, maybe some of it really does suck. And so they validate that, which is great. They tell you that it actually does suck. You were right. And then, or they say, Oh, well, this is actually does not suck. Let's play it. Let's play it together. And and then they bring in their stuff. And so, was, and, and you start playing around in this middle ground, which is your exactly between your aesthetic and their aesthetic. And you just like, um, your tastes are all melding and, you know, you're coming up with thing and you're coming up with, you're sort of lessening the, the possibilities. Um, and when you lessen all the, the possibilities, you actually get some stuff done, you know, when you limit yourself to a certain extent. Do you find yeah. that it, it's hard for you to do that all by yourself, even now, like to put yourself up to that kind of scrutiny without any sort of collaborators? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think the problem is, is that it makes it, there's so many layers of being, um, objective of trying to there's so many layers of not being able to be objective that I have to get past um you know like the the there's the music there's the arrangement there's the lyrics like I said like being objective about your own lyrics is fucking impossible um and so you get into this are you supposed to be objective about your own lyrics 
Uh, you mean, I don't know. You know, that's a good guy. Right, but but I guess my vibe is like wanting to respond. Like there's things that I've written that I really do respond to that I really like that I'm happy with. There's not very many of them. Oops, I just knocked the microphone. There're not very many of them, but there's definitely you know, there's definitely some some things that I I really do respond to, you know, that I that I've written music that lyrically. Um uh, and but it, it 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 takes like you have to take take off your writer's hat and put on a, your listener's hat, you know. I don't know. That's a good question, though. Is it? I think maybe you know maybe the reason it's so hard is that I put on my listener's hat too much, you know. Maybe I mean I really do. I mean like I'm immediately like, God, I can't stand, <laughs> I can't fucking stand this, blah blah blah. You know, I just can't. I get super critical of it, you know. Um, well, it so, seems like Joe. at this point you've you've kind of uh, you have a very impressive balance between your scoring work and then doing a band and raising a family. I mean, are you do you feel like you've gotten to a good place? Yeah, I think it's a good balance. I miss the Fugazi guys. I do. I mean, I definitely miss uh, the craft. You know, some some of the crafting of music that we did I and really the everybody sort of taking it as seriously as possible that's kind of the thing I I have yet to find I mean we take it seriously to a certain extent in death fix but not not in the, not in the same way where it's just like really bending over backwards to not repeat repeat ourselves and I mean I don't want to again I don't want to I mean I I love working with rich but you know we've it's been it's been hard to have like a full band you know all the time when it's sort of a part-time band to begin with you know and it's a part-time band in general i what i miss is like every everything being at stake like in fugazi where you just have to write something that is uh you have to work on it you know, you have to work on it really, really, really hard until it actually sinks to you, you know, until you actually really feels like it's still, till the song really feels like a uh, progression um, from your former material. I mean, that was, and that business of writing those kinds of songs and making those kind of records is really hard. I mean, that's a really hard business to be in. It takes years to make a record. Um, and you have to really always put it up against your own judgment all the time. You always have to be judging the song and, and opening yourself up to it and seeing if it hits you. And if it doesn't, you have to be super honest about it. And you have to really tell, tell the other people in the band about it. And you have to, you know, it's, and it just really is a long process that, that whole thing of, um, being your own com- commander, you know, in a in a in a big boat like that. Um, All right. Well, I think we've uh, covered everything. Is there anything else that you wanted to touch on? <laughs> I have a couple couple movies coming out. One with the. Okay, I'm going to plug a couple. They're going to come out later this year. One is the. I don't even know what it's called, but it's going to be a movie about the Solid Sound Festival which is uh, a festival that Wilco throws up in the Berkshires at Mass Mocha, and we filmed that, and that should be out beginning of next year, I think. Um, and then another one is called The Liberation. It's a documentary about uh, the D.C. Central Kitchen here in D.C. and a bunch of the students, and uh, uh, that also should be out um, next um, spring. And you directed both of those movies, right? Yeah, with my with my partner christoph green he's my partner in trixie film so you can check out trixiefilm.com um or death fix on facebook or deathfix.com or that's about it but yeah trixiefilm.com you could look at a bunch of uh, the burn to shine stuff and a lot of the film stuff there's clips up there of everything so take a look all right brendan thanks so much thanks joe Thanks for listening to the first episode of The Trap Set. The Trap Set is produced by me, along with Chris Karwowski, who also edits the show. 
follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at The Trap Set. Check out our website at thetrapset.net. And if you enjoyed the show today, please make a donation. Next week, I'll talk to Indugu Chancellor about playing with Miles, Herbie Hancock, and recording Michael Jackson's Thriller album. Thriller album.